Our mission is to promote and support interdisciplinary teaching, research, and meaningful public engagement to advance the production and dissemination of knowledge about Latin America and Iberia. Latin America is designated as one of seven priority areas of research for UNM. We proudly contribute to both the university's intellectual community as well as global discourse through programming. Uh, I'd like to first acknowledge that the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia. The original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo Navajo and Apache, since time immemorial have deep connection to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide. We honor the land itself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. This evening's panel, working in DC from internship to chief of staff and beyond, will be moderated by Soledad Roybal. Soledad is a graduate student in the Latin American Studies program at the University of New Mexico. She previously served in the Obama administration at both the US Department of State and the US Department of Labor. At the State Department, she was the White House liaison, then a senior advisor in the Economic Bureau, where she represented the United States internationally on tech policy issues. Uh, before I pass the Zoom mic to Soledad, I would like to remind everyone uh, to mute your mics. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end, and we encourage you to enter them into the chat, or you can unmute and ask um, questions uh, of our panelists directly. Uh, so Soledad, uh, thank you for moderating this evening. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm excited to see the interest um, from people who are interested in working in Washington, DC. <clears throat> we definitely need to increase the ranks of New Mexicans who are out there um, making a difference, both for New Mexico, for our country, and for the world. Um, tonight on our panel, we have Aaron Trujillo, who is the Deputy Chief of Staff for Senator Ben Ray Lujan. We have uh, Maria Meyer, who is an inclusion expert and a leader on diversity and in the public sector, um, diversity in the public sector. <clears throat> She's also the founder of We Are the People, which trains diverse professionals who impact politics and policy and promotes careers in public service. And finally, we have Raul Alviar, who is the executive vice president of Resolute Public Affairs. Um, I will first pass it to Aaron to give us a brief introduction, um, and then Maria, and then Raul. Hi, and I want to thank Soledad and uh, Francis for, for hosting us tonight. Um, my name is Aaron Trujillo. Uh, I graduated from the University of New Mexico in, in 2007. Uh, I'm originally from a small town in northern New Mexico by the name of El Rancho, and I went to Powake High School. Uh, I came to DC uh, by way of working on state and local politics in the state of New Mexico. Uh, I used to do field organizing, a lot of door-to-door -door canvassing and other things, and I just sort of had a knack for working in the, in the political space. Um, during Bill Richardson, Governor Bill Richardson's 2006 re-election campaign, I worked on uh, his political team with a few other folks doing student outreach uh, at the University of New Mexico. And when he uh, decided to run for president, uh, and if you remember, there, there were many people running for president at that time, uh, from uh, Hillary Clinton to Barack Obama, uh, as well as our own governor, Bill Richardson in the state of New Mexico, I got the opportunity to go and spend eight months and work in the Iowa caucuses that are so famous uh, as a starting point for our political process uh, in the United States of America. Um, when, when I came back to New Mexico, I worked on several other campaigns and I was fortunate to get the opportunity to work in the office of Congressman Ben Ray Lujan, who represents, who represented the third congressional district, who's now a Senator. Uh, and I worked in his office for about six years, uh, had additional opportunities to work in the Obama administration at the United States Department of Commerce, uh, in the office of legislative affairs. Uh, and then the last several years I've spent as a uh, government affairs, uh, professional and lobbyist in Washington. And most recently, I took a job uh, back as the deputy chief of staff for uh, now Senator Ben Lujan to help set up his office here in Washington, DC. And so I look forward to the questions. Thank you again uh, for having us uh, and go Lobos. Thank you, Aaron. 
Uh, Maria. Thanks so much, Soledad, and thank you to you and Francis for the invitation for putting this event together. I'm so excited that so many of you are interested or at least exploring the idea of getting into public service and maybe making some of your career in DC. Uh, as Soledad said, my name is Maria Robles Meyer. I was born here in Albuquerque, where I live now. Uh, we moved when I was a baby, so in full disclosure, I didn't grow up here but have spent my life coming back here and make New Mexico home again uh, after a number of years of being away. Uh, I am first generation college and probably was the first person in my family actually to visit Washington DC. When I was in high school, one of the Hispanic organizations had an essay contest and the winner got uh, a chance to participate in a week long trip with a group, a high school group, to go to see DC. And so I entered and I won. And I went to DC and was sort of bowled away by the energy and the magic of the place. I knew that I wanted to go back. Um, I was never an intern because back in that day, like they still do, unfortunately, now internships weren't paid and I couldn't afford to intern for free. But that's one myth I hope that we explore. You don't have to be an intern to get a job in DC. I went back after college, got my first job answering phones and I've done a lot of jobs in between. I've been in positions where I've been the first one, first Latina, the only one, the only woman of color, the only woman in many situations. And I've had some wonderful experiences and I've had some really challenging experiences. I've had jobs like being the director of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, where I work for about 20 members sitting national agendas that impact our community. And then I've worked in positions that helped others build their career on the Hill. And that really ignited my passion to create my own job and my own uh, consulting firm, which is what I do now, which is to help people like some of you out there who wanna build their careers in public service, learn the leadership skills and find the empowerment to tell your story. Before you all logged on, we were chatting a little bit and we were talking about New Mexico history and Hispano history. And I made a comment that there's so much of our story that needs to be told. Uh, one thing about Zoom is it, it's very visual. So I hope you can see the painting behind me. It's from a local artist here in New Mexico and it's called Storyteller. And I love this and I love having this in these, in these Zoom sessions because so much of what we do is telling our story. And all of you have a story that needs to be told in places where you can impact and shape politics and policy. So I look forward to hearing from you and being a resource to you as you figure out your careers in telling that story. So thank you. Great, thank you, Maria. Um, before we go to Raul, I just wanna um, ask anyone who has a question, please um, raise your hand or feel free to type your question into the chat and um, I'm happy to read it out loud, um, but we're also happy to have you give your question live. Um, Raul? Great, thank you, Soledad. Uh, thank you, Soledad and uh, Francis for again, uh, having us on and having this discussion. It's very timely and it's also very important. And, you know, it's great to be here with such great panelists like Maria, she's a legend in, 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 in DC and in New Mexico. So I've worked with her for, for many years and. It's good to be with Aaron, who is is a legend. It's going to be a bigger legend in 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 in, in uh, DC. So, uh, so we have a good group uh, uh, to to hear from here. Um, so again, you know, my name is Raul Alviad. Uh, I start. I too am an alumnus of uh, of UNM. Everyone's low boat. Whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, I'm from a small town uh, as well. Um, from Comen, New Mexico, which is uh, the, uh, the east side of the river um, in between Belen and Los Lunas. And I went to Belen High School uh, where I graduated and then uh, went on to UNM. Um, so my career path has, has been kind of interesting. Um, you know, I started off uh, in 2000 uh, working on the Al Gore uh, uh, race. Um, you know, I was uh, started off at much like Aaron uh, in the field and I got to get a good understanding of what that is, what that entails and, and what you have to do uh, to, to, to have a winning campaign. Um, after that campaign, I have worked on every single presidential elect, uh, campaign 
uh, since um, Al Gore. Um, I worked for John Kerry um, for a while, forever, <laughs> and I worked for, uh, then uh, he decided that he wasn't going to run for president uh, the second time, uh, which I was working for his PAC, Keeping America's Promise and, and um, um, moving, um, uh, Keeping America's Promise and, and, uh, and his PAC for his presidential bid should he had decided to run um, for president again. He decided not to, and then I got a call from a number of different folks, and I won't say who, um, but I um, didn't go with our native son of Bill Richardson. I actually went with Barack Obama, and I started on his campaign in 2007 of March, uh, and the reason why I remember that is because when I went moved to Chicago, the river was green next to our, our high-rise <laughs> uh, uh, campaign headquarters, so it was St. Patrick's Day. Um, is when I started. So, uh, so did that. Then um, continued to work for Barack Obama. Uh, I worked at HUD, where I worked on a number of different issues, uh, from sustainable communities um, to uh, working on homelessness issues to LGBTQ issues to making sure that people don't get discriminated against, so on and so forth. Um, after that, I went and worked at the White House, um, where I was the LGBT. Hugh liaison for the White House, um, as some people like to call, used to call me as the head gay in charge. Um, so I was, I was doing that for the for the campaign and for the White House. Excuse me, for the White House, not the campaign. Um, and then, once I was done with that, uh, I was asked to become the national political director of the Democratic Party. Um, and that's kind of an interesting feat. It was one of the most interesting jobs that I've ever had, but it was also kind of a jarring. Um, first initial experience, because the reason why I say that, much like Maria doing and becoming a lot of firsts, um, I was the first Hispanic national political director that the party had ever had in its 220 some, 250 years, however many years. So that to me, I was like, that can't be true. That's no, there's no way, <laughs> but it was. And so, um, and so I am honored to join Maria. At, uh, Maria is one of you know, one of the first, um, hopefully we're not the first anymore and we're num num lots of, lots of us uh, continue and go on and do lots of other great things and, and, you know, and open up the, you know, the, the, the pathway for everybody. Um, so I became the, the, the national political director. Um, so I did, so I've been mostly doing politics. I've worked for venture capital firms. I'm now the executive vice president. So now I'm C-suite, so I've made it. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we're working in C-suite uh, with uh, Resolute, which is a boutique elite uh, firm. Uh, we do a lot of stuff around uh, security issues um, and we have a SCIF in our office. Um, and so we do a lot of top secret information and a lot of top secret stuff for a lot of big companies. But we also do a lot of public affairs around different crazy, uh, different stuff as well. Um, so I've been there. Um, I also, um, I'm wrapping up, I promise, so that, um, I have, uh, I, I am. Well, I just constantly... wanted to explain what a skiff was. Oh, okay. So a skiff is where um, you, there's a skiff usually wherever the president or the vice president or anybody who has really high security clearance to go into a room, have access to internet, uh, to the phones, et cetera, et cetera, to be debriefed, debriefed uh, in a private area in a, in a, it's basically a box, a cone, if you will, that nobody can hear or anything can be transmitted in or anything can be transmitted out. So it's a very secure place that nobody can, can, can penetrate. Um, so, so anyway, so the re reason why I mentioned that, and thank you for asking that because a lot of people don't know uh, what a skiff is and, and that's the, you know, the type of clients that we deal with. Um, so yeah, so I, I, so I, I also have, Ventured to to be uh, I'm a pundit on Fox News, Fox and Friends, Fox uh, Fox Business. Uh, do a lot of stuff internationally, and I've also written a book about uh, my political journey and my life story and how that goes and kind of a biography, hopefully. Um, and my editors and my publicists and folks keep pushing me to do this, so that's what I'm going to do after this, so I can get the book out and hopefully some somebody will read it. But that's kind of my journey. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, look forward to having a conversation with you all and, and seeing how we can be helpful and give any tips or ideas or, or see what we can do to, to help you guys out. And I'll end there. 
Great, thank you, Raul. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Maria. Um, so we actually have started to get some questions in. Um, so Teresa McGarity and uh, I'm sorry, Kira Bulby and Sarah Ladipo um, have two very similar questions. Um, and the questions are basically um, how to find internships in DC. And I would actually even expand and, and suggest internships here in New Mexico. Um, and uh, how can you maximize in these internships once you get them? So I will toss it out to whoever wants to go, raise your hand. I can jump in there first. Um, you all have a wonderful uh, political science department at the University of New Mexico. That was the school that I attended uh, when I was uh, a student there. Uh, you have a program called the Fred Harris Internship Program. Uh, former United States Senator Fred Harris from the state of Oklahoma uh, is a professor there and has hosted that program um, that we specifically work in the congressional offices from the New Mexico uh, congressional delegation. And New Mexico has five members of Congress, uh, two United States senators, just like every state does, and then three members of Congress, um, one in Northern New Mexico, one in Central New Mexico, one in Southern New Mexico, and that's based on, on population. Uh, and uh, those, those offices will partner with the Fred Harris program to place students in internships in, in both Washington, D.C. and the state of New Mexico. Uh, there are other outside organizations, um, the Congressional um, Hispanic Caucus Institute, uh, the, Congress, the Congressional Black Caucus uh, Institute, and, some, uh, and other organizations that will work with college students to find in, internships in offices and help place students uh, in, in both congressional offices, in um, administrative departments and agencies, and at companies. Um, a lot of companies have uh, government affairs departments, and that is because a lot of companies, and I'll use telecommunications as an example, but uh, you know, there are so many companies out there that have to engage with the federal government, with local and state governments every single day and it impacts their bottom line. Uh, and so sometimes even companies will have internships uh, to bring people in to do government affairs work and liaise uh, between their company and, or their business and the federal government and different agencies as well. And so those are just some of a few of the areas where you can look to find some of those opportunities. I'll add a bit to that. Um, I'm gonna be a little more philosophical. And I'm gonna start with suggesting that you figure out or you decide for yourself what it is you wanna get out of your internship and what you really wanna focus on. If your main focus is, I just wanna experience since we're talking about DC, I wanna just see what it's like to be on DC, great. Then you've got a wider range to choose from. And Aaron mentioned this, there are various areas within, You know, I think it's the case in Santa Fe, it's the case in DC. You can work, you can enter directly for an elected member. So on Capitol Hill, and Aaron, I'm going to guess if we went to Senator Ben Ray Lujan's uh, website, there's going to be a tab or somewhere about information on how to be an intern. So if you're working, if you're going to intern directly for an elected member, they generally want you to have some connection, either from the state, from the congressional district, went to school in that that district or that state. So there's some, you know, they, their first obligation is, is to choose from a local pool. Beyond that, and uh, someone like Soledad or Raul can speak a little more to internship opportunities in the executive branch, which would be the White House and all the federal agencies. They're the ones that implement the programs, you know, Congress passes law, and then they implement the programs. You know, Congress passes a law saying there should be social security. The president sets this agenda. Yes, we want this. Then social security administration gets those checks out. So there's each of these agencies has its function. So they have internship programs. Then there are the advocacy lobbyists, another word for advocacy, but say you really care about polar bears. That's important. You might get more direct experience on law or policy, you know, uh, legislation or policy that impacts polar bears working for the Wilderness Fund. So decide what you want to focus on and do a little bit of research is like who's interested either regionally that you've got a connection to that office or interest wise, study wise, you've got a connection to that issue and see who the players are in that field. And 
likely they're all going to have internships. You go to their website and that's the first step is apply through the official channels. So good luck. Yeah, um, so, so, so there's, there's, there's a number of different uh, organizations that you can get involved with. And, and there's, a new, there's an organization that started uh, by a friend of ours um, who is called it's paid, Pay Your Interns. Um, and so he started this uh, group. And so there's a, uh, and it's to advocate uh, on behalf of interns because like Maria mentioned earlier, and I know I wasn't in a position to go and uh, go and work for free uh, and pay, you know, crazy rent, <laughs> um, you know, and, you know, at that point you have to say, do you want to, you know, pay crazy rent or live with 10 people? It just depends. So, um, but they're, they're a good resource. Um, but to also touch on, on what Maria said too, I think, um, and, and I hated this question when I got this question every single time. Um, so they ask you, well, what do you want to do? Like, what's your end result? Uh, but it, and as I start, you know, started going on my trajectory of my career, um, it's it's a it's a good question um, because it'll help you work about work backwards uh, to what your ultimate goal is. So if Solomon Johnson wants to be, you know, um, you know, work at the Department of Energy and be a head physicist or the Secretary of Energy, then what is he going to have to do to to do that? Um, so you need to, so it'll help you develop a pathway to what you need to do uh, and to where you need to go. Um, but the other thing that I, you know, that, and, and I've done a lot of these talks and, you know, as I mentioned, I was at the DNC and so we used to do brown bags with all our interns and, and all of our people that were working with us uh, at, the at, the, at the DNC. And, you know, I, 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 I tell, would tell them a hundred times over, it's like, just do your work, do it 110% and people will realize that and people will notice that um, and people will be all, oh, you know, Jacob Templeton is great at doing X, Y, and Z. So let's help him get to where he needs to get. Um, the, the other thing is, uh, if you are going to get involved in politics um, and on the, on the level, we're always looking for, for people to be involved because we need young folks like yourself uh, to, you know, help us old people like, or older, I should say, <laughs> or, or those catching up to us, um, you know, help with doing what we're gonna do because we can't do this by ourselves. So we, so honestly, like you're the backbone interns and people who are, are just wanting to learn more about stuff are the backbone of politics, um, are the backbones of, of a lot of organizations. Um, Maria had asked us to kind of touch a little bit more on the federal aspect. Um, White House. Who doesn't want to work at the White House? So I say that because it's extremely competitive. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try. That doesn't mean that you should go out there. That doesn't mean I can be helpful or that doesn't mean any of us can be helpful to you on this panel. You should always aim high, but, but also know the realization of what you're getting into. So White House, there's also like, there, there's White House fellowships that you can apply to um, that come up every single year. Um, and if you become a White House fellow, that's like amazing. And that's like, you know, they reserve that for like the top, you know, in their, in their kind of classes and their fields or whatever they're working on. And, and, and you, that's a good way to get involved with the White House. Uh, they also take, um, and we also take interns as well. But the problem with that is that you have to, you know, I'm sure all of you, you have to pass security clearances, et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth. So you can do that, you should apply. Um, in terms of federal, agencies as, as, as independent agencies, whether it's DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, or the State Department with Surly God work, you know, they each individually have their own kind of process on how they go ahead and accept uh, interns. Uh, a lot of these times, uh, the agencies will actually pay uh, their interns. So you want to essentially um, try to get a paid internship if you, if you can. And if you don't need to get paid, then you know, you can, you, you can, you have a little bit more flexibility, but um, my advice to you on that is just make sure you go to the website of the agency, look up their internships, and it'll tell you exactly precisely what they're looking for, if they're paid, if they're not paid, uh, and what that process is. Um, so I would, my other advice to you all is I would start doing that now, um, because you're a little bit behind the ball, uh, if you haven't already, because this, the, the federal government is not the fastest. 
um, but uh, but it's it is a process. So you'll need to go to a different couple of different processes. So if you want to do that, I would start looking at the websites for the different agencies and see what that process is and start that that process with the with with the agencies. Great, thank you, Raúl. Um, I will chime in a little bit on this also. Um, in terms of internships, I think that there are um, actually a fair number of opportunities locally. Um, it's worth checking in with the local offices in Albuquerque and Santa Fe and other parts of the state. I had my first internship in Roswell um, when I was in high school. And, you know, I would go a couple days a week and cut newspaper clippings and, you know, learn about what it was like working in the state office. Um, and then I was not is in CHCI or anything like that when I was in college. Um, I just didn't really know about any of those programs. Um, but I just walked into my congressman's office, who was um, Bill Richardson at the time. And this was before paid internships were as um, common. Unfortunately, it's really exciting that they're common, more common now. But I basically said, what do I need to do to be an intern? And they were happy for, to have free help. <laughs> Um, so sometimes it's really just about having the initiative to go in and say, hey, I'm from New Mexico. I, you know, I'm here in school. I would really love an opportunity to be an intern. What do I need to do to make that happen? Um, in terms of the federal agencies, um, the State Department is challenging, not so much because they're looking for, you know, the Ivy League degrees or any of these things. It's challenging because of the time it takes. I would suggest starting your application, if you can do it a year in advance, do it a year in advance to what you, you know, that time frame you think you want to actually be an intern, particularly because you do have to go through a security clearance process. And an intern is not at the top of the list of who's going to be getting the clearances. Um, so, you know, be patient. Um, but, you know, with the State Department, some of the internships are abroad. Some of them are at the actual, you know, Washington DC office. And, you know, right now, obviously, some of the internships are remote. Um, so just be patient, but absolutely apply. And I would also look to make relationships with your members of Congress, because a letter of recommendation from them can go really far. So you can, you know, connect with Aaron, but connect with um, whoever is going to be taking um, Deb Holland's seat whenever that is decided, connect with that person um, or their, their staff. Um, Teresa Ledger, if you're um, in the third district, um, th those people can be very helpful um, in terms of getting into some of these internship programs. Um, so I don't know if anyone else has any. Can I add one more note and then I know we've got questions to move on to. If your academic schedule allows it, consider doing an internship not in the summer. Just because, you know, so that I was talking about the time it takes, that's when the majority of people do it. There's more competition and it just takes longer. Um, as Raul mentioned, you know, the process has already begun. So if you're looking for summer, you really need to get going. But if you think you can take classes remotely or take a semester off, think about fall or even winter because that's, um, there are fewer people competing for positions then and you stand the likelihood of being one of a few and get more substantive work than one of many and yeah and, and then if the i can thing also I maybe just jump in really quickly sorry raul um yeah. you know when you're when you're looking at the internships that you want to do it's really important that you start to think about how you will build up your credentials uh if if you're not as um bona fide in a particular area uh, especially if you want to do something that's got an international focus, or if you want to do something that's got an energy or a technology focus, or if you want to do something that's environmental in nature, dealing with climate change and other things. Um, you know, part of that is, is you know, looking at your classes and the other, the other organizations that you might be involved with on campus and other things. But there are a ton of affiliated national organizations that operate in New Mexico or have chapters there, like the League of Conservation Voters, or the Hispano Chamber of Commerce or other things. And those are organizations that you can either volunteer with or, or try to work directly with to build up your credentials so that when you spot that uh, unique opportunity to apply for an internship in DC, and just like Raul mentioned, a lot of these um, internships are highly competitive because you're dealing with uh, people from all over the, the nation. 
Um, it's important that you have built up some credentials so that you're qualified to put your best put, foot forward uh, in a position like that. And hopefully, you know, a lot of times your internship will lead to a job or is the first stepping stone uh, as part of a career. Um, and so just some things to think about as you're putting your applications together. Yeah, and then just one last thing, sorry, it's only that. Um, the, the other thing is, is I, I was an intern myself. So, you know, as I guess the title says from intern to whatever, you know, what we're doing now, but I was an intern with it's the, the Democratic Party of New Mexico and that's how I got started on the trajectory. Um, on, on, and, and so, so look at your local parties as well, uh, because each uh, county has a local local uh, Democratic Party or Republican Party. I know not everybody's uh, a Democrat. But, um, we're all Lobos, but not all Democrats. But anyway, um, so, um, you know, you can get involved with your local party, but then also not only that, but your, your local candidates as well that are that are in the state legislature or in the state Senate, because they need tons of help. Uh, because it's a very short time, but, and then I'll stop on that and then we can move on. <laughs> um, so on this note, there has been a request um, and I will defer Maria, put her email in the chat. Um, if Raul and Aaron are comfortable, you're welcome to put your information in the chat. But speaking of that, let's talk about networking. Um, I will, uh, you know, let's start with Maria because I will give an example of how she has been important in my network. When I decided to try to uh, get into the Obama administration, one of the people that I talked to was Maria because she was incredibly well connected and was able to put in a good word for me. And that made a huge difference. So talk to us about networking, Maria, and then we can go to either Aaron or Raul, if either of you have anything to say. I appreciate the kudos, Soledad, but I tell everyone who says, oh, you held me. I said, no, you got the job. Uh, so Raul mentioned that he does a lot of these panels and I get asked to too. And I, I love talking to people at all stages in their career, but I got asked to speak at a panel a couple of years back, uh, actually at my alma mater at the uh, Public Service Center. And it, all of us on the panel were in public service jobs. And right before I got ready to go on, uh, one of the coordinators comes over and whispers in my ears like, oh, by the way, we don't use the word networking with the students. And I said, okay, I do. Networking is not a bad word. Uh, and I have run into this a lot. Um, in the last position I had on the Hill, I mentioned I worked in a uh, I worked in a very unique office created by the Senate Democratic leader to create an initiative to get more diversity hiring. So I talked to lots of people, probably over like 1500 on very stages and how to get in their career. And I noticed that I was starting to see a pattern, particularly with people earlier on in their career, that they really had this bias against networking and saw it as very transactional and very phony. And my response to that is, you get the energy that you put into it. First of all, politics, if you even look at the word, it's, it's a people-oriented industry. So networking isn't about using someone. I mean, if you use someone, you're going to get used, but if you, it's not about using someone to get somewhere. It's about building a coalition of resources because when you get in these positions, they are very demanding. And you're expected to know a lot of stuff. There's no way you're going to know everything that you may be in charge of. But it's really helpful if you know someone who knows who's going to know. So use your network, not just to get a position, but to do your job well and to do your job better and to connect with the people out in the community. You need a network to know what's going on back home. You know, Aaron, you need your network is telling you what's going on on the ground. Can't exist in your bubble alone. So networking is building that coalition of people who share something with you, but who are also going to be an asset and you in turn, you know, it's reciprocity. So developing that, and it may seem scary. And I also share the story that I'm old enough and I'm giving this away. When I first went to DC, email wasn't as big a thing as it was. So you actually had to pick up the phone old fashioned and call people. And I was told like, um, by, by an administrator who was a mentor of mine at college when I went for DC, it's like, okay, I got a name and here's a couple of people, when you get to DC, call them because you're gonna to need to network. 
It's like, I'm supposed to call this total stranger. I don't know, say, hi, you don't know me. Will you go buy me coffee? And by the way, help me get a job. And I should just pray that when I called, I would get voicemail because I would start stuttering and not know what to say. So at least you've got the advantage, you've got email. But it really just takes that one first person, anyone who's in this panel, I'm volunteering you guys, but you know, one of us to start with a process of asking questions that can help you learn about the process. Doesn't mean I'm gonna get you a job. It's not really my job and I don't know that I can, but I can sure share tips that I've seen what's worked for me and what hasn't worked and what I've seen that works for others. And from there, you again, you continue to nurture that coalition and build it out of people who share that interest or in that field. You learn from them and then in turn, you share what you learn with others and help you know them along the path. That's my overly philosophical approach to networking. Great, uh, Aaron, Raul, do either of you have anything you wanna add? I, I do, Raul, go first. Sorry for interrupting you last time. No, 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 of course. Uh, I, no. Uh, yeah, I mean, I you, you can't do our jobs without networking. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, and it isn't a bad word. And I, and I, I have a couple of things, uh, you know, uh, my, my philosophy is if you all do good and then I do good. So I want everybody to do good. I want people to go work on the Hill. I want people to go work at the department of energy. I want people to go, uh, to, to just, to do, to do well for themselves. Um, because what happens when you start to do that, then you remember, like, I, I'll tell you a story. I, I had it and I didn't really remember, um, this person, but I wouldn't tell that to anybody else. So, but, so don't repeat this, but I had a person reach out to me. I, and I, you know, I'm very, I guess, easy to get a hold of because you can Google or whatever, but he reached out to me and he said, you know, I don't know if you remember this, but you spoke to us on much like a panel like this. And you talked about, um, about, you know, and you gave me some advice and I followed the advice and I never told you this, but now I'm now the, the you know, deputy person for the, for Governor Pritzker in Illinois. And I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't have heard what you said. Um, and so that's a perfect example of, 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 you know, your networking and now I have somebody there, but then he's now, you know, still using me as a reference to see if I could be helpful on some other stuff. So it's about helping people. It's about making sure that you want to, see them do well. Uh, and then the other thing is, is, is at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I've been in politics for a number of years and you, what the name of the game is building your networks and building your list. So I also tell people, there's not a city in this country that I could travel to that I will not have a free place to stay or two or three places. Um, and so that's what my value is. And that's what I bring to the table for a number of different. So, so if something happens or something's going on and this is, I mean, Aaron's that's the same trajectory in the same kind of, you know, space in that Maria and Soledad and I work in is like, you know, they'll call um, and my nickname with people is called hook them up Raul. Cause if you need something, you call Raul and he'll help you figure it out. Now I get, Bloody, I was going to say the F word, sorry. <laughs> I get uh, calls from everyone and everybody from, you know, I need, my son needs an internship, uh, uh, you know, on the subcommittee on this to, I want to become a Supreme Court judge. What do I need to do? You know, so the gamut's far and wide, but, but, you know, and I think I was like, okay, what, I don't ask anything from anybody. So like, you know, but, but it, that also, that says something about you, you and your network and your value. So at the end of the day, you know, when I was working for John Kerry, you know, I'm traveling all over the country with him, potentially having him run again for, for office. And so I'm, you know, much like Aaron and other folks that have worked in Iowa before are going to Iowa all the time. I'm going to Ohio all, all the time, I'm going to Florida all the time. You know, you're, and then you start, to, you start to figure out like, what are these buckets of people? Are they political? Are they financial? Are they, are they, you know, people that will help me get involved in my in my career? Um, so, so it's not a bad thing. And then eventually, the la one last point, and I'll turn it over to you, uh, is the last thing that I tell people. I remember when I would, when I was just a young guy, discovering DC in 2004 when I moved there, um, and. You know, you go into the room and you're like, oh, I want to talk to this person. I need to talk to this person. Like, you know, that, that, you know, just, you know, their people are there to see this one person. Eventually, if you play your cards right, you do your job well, 
and you su do succeed at your at your at your career, they're just gonna, you're those people. You're going to be the one that people are coming to see, to talk to, and to get inf information and advice to. So you want to get to that point. Um, and so it's 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 just uh, you know think of it in modern day. I guess like you know everyone's obsessed with oh my god how many Instagram likes did I get today, uh, or you know like you. But these are these are you know how many real tangible people do you have that you can actually utilize for a job position that you might you know say you might work for you know the legal conservation uh, voters LCV like who do I know in that realm in my network to actually help me do my job or to help me help somebody else do their job. And that's the most important part. And that's kind of where I think networking is super, super important and is a must. Great, thank you, Raul. Aaron. Absolutely agree with all that's been said. And I, I will say to sort of put it into context, uh, you know, at least for, for, for me, you know, culturally, I grew up in a household where, you know, my mother would say, que vergüenza, you know, how embarrassing you're gonna go up there and ask this person for something, you know, and, and um, the thing that I would say that I've learned, and it was hard for me to start networking properly uh, when I first moved to DC, uh, uh, is that if you don't ask for what you want, somebody else is gonna ask for what they want and they're gonna get it. And so, you know, put that into context. And again, it's not about a quid pro quo or, or you know, uh, you know, using somebody or something as uh, uh, Maria mentioned, uh, it's about, gathering information, gathering knowledge, helping help others educate you as to what is going on out there, whether it's in the community or whether it's in a business. Uh, business people network as well. The, the information that you're able to obtain from having a conversation with somebody uh, can, can change your life. Um, and so, you know, think about it in that context. And if, you, if you're shy or if you grew up in a household where, uh, you know, uh, you weren't as vocal or maybe as straightforward with, with your conversations, um, you know, think about it as, as an opportunity for you to learn, uh, learn something and gain information and, uh, and gain a friendship. The other thing that I'll say is as you begin to network and as you begin to um, build your career and if you get that internship and other things, open the door for others as well uh, when they come asking for uh, your advice or your help uh, in identifying opportunities. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's folks like Raul who have, and, and Maria who have paved the path for someone like me to be uh, a deputy chief of staff in the United States Senate. And there aren't that many uh, of us uh, here serving in these roles. Um, but I always make sure that uh, every opportunity I can and that's a big part of why I was so excited to participate in this panel today, uh, to open the door for others um, as well uh, when, you, when you launch your careers and, and when you're networking. Great, thank you, Aaron. And I'll chime in a little bit on this also. Um, I think that, you know, for me, I felt very blessed because my political experience on the Hill was really in New Mexican offices with the New, New Mexico delegation. And it was a very easy transition because you know, if I said I'm from Santa Fe, people understood that if I, you know, talked about, you know, it was always, you know, we had this thing in common, regardless of our ethnicity, regardless of whatever it was, most many of us were from New Mexico, and there was a certain sort of family experience that was very supportive, um, that I actually don't think other larger states necessarily have. So take advantage that, you know, we're from a small state and we definitely, there's the New Mexico State Society, there's all these support systems that can really help you to network. And, you know, if you identify as LGBTQ, there's organizations that you can become a part of to help you network in those communities. If you identify as indigenous, as African-American, as Latino, whatever, there are all these different groups that you can, um, just go and be a part of, attend a happy hour, attend uh, an event. If there's a particular thing that you really enjoy, um, maybe it's tech policy, there's constantly events and they usually start out with a cocktail reception and a, you know, or end with a cocktail reception. <laughs> <laughs> and those are great opportunities to just go and introduce yourself and build up your confidence. Um, but be authentic, be who you are, be proud of who you are, be proud of being from New Mexico. And um, that authenticity will be appreciated. Um, 
So we have uh, Andrew Schumann who wants to ask a question. So let me find Andrew and unmute you. Okay, I'm asking to unmute you. All right. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Andrew Schumann. I'm a junior here at UNM. Um, I was actually recently accepted to the Fred Harris internship program um, for next ah. spring. So um, Aaron, Congratulations. Nice seeing you uh, next spring. Um, uh, on that note, I wanted to ask you guys kind of about the day-to-day uh, operations of, you know, like what you do and what's it like, you know, because I'm a huge fan of the West Wing. So, you know, working on Capitol Hill or in the White House or at the DNC, is it is it inspiring? Is it exhausting? Is it both? I just, you know, if you could talk on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'll take it. Go ahead, Maria. Go ahead, Maria. No, go ahead. I've been starting. Let's go in reverse. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so yeah, um, I, I tell people, you know, even, you know, they're, ah, oh, politics is boring. I'm like, it's not, not boring at all. Let me tell you, <laughs> because, you know, from one second to the next second, you're, there, there's could be a number of different things that change. Um, there's a lot of different levers and mechanisms that, that, you know, affect what, you know, your outcome is going to be from what you might have thought that the uh, goal was going to be. Um, I will say that I've actually never physically worked on the Hill. Um, but I did work for Tom Udall here in the district um, in, in New Mexico. Uh, so I can't really, you know, I mean, I, it's, it's hectic everywhere, um, but it's, it's, it's organized chaos. And if you can manage it and you can, the other thing is, is that I give advice is always remain calm. Don't freak out, don't lose your hair. Don't like, ah, you know, cause then people are like, okay, what's going on? <laughs> like, you know, you get that, that's, because a lot of people, when something, when, you know, stuff hits the fan, you know, people freak out. But if you're like able to remain calm and say, okay, I'm the adult in the room. This is what's happening. This is what the goals were, but this is how we're going to change the, the, you know, the, the idea or the, the project itself. And that just doesn't happen in politics. That's, I mean, like I deal with that on a daily basis, every 20 minutes, you know, in my day job. Um, whether we, you know, we're advising Raytheon on something and then they're like, oh, well, this isn't gonna, you know, um, be helpful, then we have to switch the whole plan. But the other thing is, is it's also kind of think in your head, like what is, what are the inputs and what are the outputs? If I say something, what will happen as a result? Uh, if uh, we do something, what will happen as a result? Um, so you have to think ahead. Uh, of what will happen uh, because of something you said or you did. Um, the other thing that I advise to people, and this is, I'm old school um, political, like, you know, we were always told that do not put things into email unless you want, unless you want it on the Washington Post the next morning. So make sure you, you know, when you go in, you know, you're going to have a lot of coming at you. You're going to have all these kind of things that are going to, you know, be affecting your decision making. But just make sure, and I still do this to 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 the very day, to every single time I put anything in an email. Do I want do I want this to be out in the public? No. Then I call somebody or do whatever. So just make sure you you do that that piece. But uh, it, it's exhilarating. It's um, you know the when I I think you know when I worked at the White House, it was just insane. Like. You know, I gained way too much weight, uh, was not sleeping, um, you know, um, and you're just there because you're serving the American people and you're doing the job for the American people. And that's gratifying. And and I got involved in politics because I was bright eyed and bushy tailed and believed that we're going to change the world. Um, you will change the world and you can change the world, but it may not be like that, you know, so. So just be patient, but also be aggressive to to Aaron's point earlier, um, because if you don't ask for what you want, you ain't gonna get it. You know, and I learned that. You know, and there's a whole other topic of conversation we can have on what else you need to do. But, but yeah, no, I mean, just just be confident in yourself. The fact that you're you know even got that internship, that's like okay, that's step one. Boom, let's go, let's run. You know, uh, and and be confident in yourself. Um, you guys are all going to be graduates of UNM, one of the best universities in, 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 in the country. Um, so yeah, so be proud of that and, 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 and know that you have stuff to, to, to contribute. Um, 
And just, again, just make sure you don't get put in the Washington Post for some weird, crazy reason. But most importantly too, though, is you, you have to remember whenever you're working for a member, for the president, for, for the secretary, for anybody who's your boss, you're an extension and a representation of that office and of that person. So at the end of the day, um, you know, like that was my thread. Like I used to do the president's, vice president's, and secretary's briefing memos every, like it was insane, like every day. And if there was one piece of information that was incorrect and they used that incorrect piece of information, you know whose ass is getting fired? Mine. So there is a lot of, lot of pressure, but you got, you know, but, but it's fun and it's, it's amazing. And, and, uh, and, you know, you can change the world if, if, if you want. Thank you, Raul. Um, Maria or Aaron? Aaron, did you want to go? Sure, and just remind me, I was responding to the chat. The question was how to approach your internship. Um, it, I just wanted to know kind of about like the day-to-day -day operations and, you know, what it's like uh, working, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a campaign staff or uh, at sure. the White House or in Capitol Hill. Yeah, I mean, the, the great thing about having the opportunity to have an internship like that, and the Fred Harris program is, is great. It's one of the better internship programs that I've seen, especially from, you know, some of our neighbors and in, in, in other states and stuff like that is you have the opportunity to share your ideas. Uh, you might get put on a project where you're you're working with a senior staffer who's got a lot of experience, and you get to share your your own experience and ideas and and your own human experience about helping to solve issues uh, for your home state or for a particular uh, constituency that you might uh, or an issue that you might be fond of, um, whether it's you know climate change or the other types of issues that you might be working on, and you have a real opportunity. Um, to make an impact, so so you should be excited about that, and don't be afraid to share your ideas. You know, no no question is a dumb question. Uh, you know, no idea uh, uh, within reason should you know should you ever feel embarrassed about about sharing, and that's a real important part as well because uh, you might have a really great idea that ha helps to, you to stand out when you're doing that internship, and that internship could potentially lead to a job. Um, uh, we've had several interns in the office of then Congressman Lujan when I was working on his staff uh, uh, several years back who started off as interns uh, and they worked really hard and they had good ideas and they weren't afraid to interact with the staff and, and provide really good feedback and, and to Raul's point, to be accurate with the information that they would gather for us. A lot of, a lot of these internship jobs are doing research and, and other types of projects like that, research projects, and it's important that you are able to cite and source your information, just like you do when you're writing papers for your professors and stuff like that. Um, and so make sure to be accurate with your information as well. But, you know, th your time in the office could lead to a job later. Um, so just make sure that you're doing all you can um, to be responsive, uh, to have good information, uh, and share your ideas as well. Thank you, Aaron. Maria? So, Andrew, first of all, congratulations. I'm very excited for you, and I hope you have a really positive experience during your internship. I just recorded a podcast earlier this week. Actually, a friend of Soledad's and, and mine invited me. It's about career stewardship, but he invited me on to talk about working on careers in DC. And we got started talking about this myth and mythology on how um, movies and TV portray working in DC. We talked about the West Wing. I, I do some work in Europe and I can't tell you every time, any country I go there, they ask me about the West Wing. How real is it? Um, I cited this movie, it was years ago with Reese Weatherspoon called Election, where she ends up working for the senator. And there's this scene of her getting in this big black limo with the senator. And we all laugh I'm like, ha ha, yeah, I feel like that's real. Um, it is an exciting place. When you're starting off with an internship, I stress to people, never underestimate the value of the small details. Never underestimate the value of showing up on time. Really, seriously, I can't tell you how many times I heard back managers, they were late, they were late. Do you research ahead of time? Who you? Of course, you're gonna know where you're working, but read online, read the latest press release, what's going on? On the Hill, it really is, so it is sort of feast and famine, meaning when they are in session, which tends to be too, Aaron can correct me. Usually it's Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday are the busiest days. It's very hectic. They're voting. 
Um, you may have more contacts from people. I know people aren't in office, so it's different now, but people are calling because there's a vote and they'll get a text from an organization saying, call your senator, call your congressman, have to pass COVID relief, have to get Deb Holland, you know, appointed secretary of the interior. So there, there's gonna be a lot more energy. When they are out of session, so during recess week, when they're working, focusing on the district stuff, maybe over holidays, it's quieter. That's when people catch up on emails and they uh, do the letters. Ultimately, your job is going to be what they tell you to do. But be that person who goes and says, what else can I do? Ask to talk to that senior members. Like, I understand you handle military issues or you handle... Uh, climate change. Do you have 15 minutes to chat? Because I'm really interested. Can you tell me about your job? So they're developing those connections, learning from those people. Um, you'll stick in their mind and they'll, you'll make yourself the person they go to when they have that work and they need the extra help. And that's how you learn. Great. So. Thank you, Maria. So um, Working on the Hill isn't the only thing that you can do in DC. And there are a lot of different skill sets that are needed for jobs from advanced to press to, um, you know, there's so many different things. Um, we did get a question on what one needs to do in FSO, to be an FSO in that process. And I'm gonna answer that, but I'm gonna then um, ask Aaron, Maria and Raul to talk about other jobs that exist in Washington, both political and non-political. Now, in terms of the foreign service, I would recommend that all of you who are interested in doing that start to take the test. It's a test that is not nearly as hard as people have told you it is. Um, and you can take it as many times as you want. Um, it may actually, it may be once a year, but as many times as you want until maybe the age of like 55. Um, so just go take the test and see how you do. Um, also, when you're thinking about the Foreign Service, look into the Pickering and Wrangle programs. Those programs will pay for your graduate school, um, and they are for underrepresented communities. And that doesn't, it, it absolutely means um, people of color, Latinos, African Americans, or uh, Black um, Americans. It means um, LGBT, but it also means people from underrepresented locations. New Mexico is incredibly underrepresented um, in terms of the State Department and Foreign Service. So look into that um, and reach out to the person who's in charge. Um, her, I'm totally blanking on her name right at the moment, but you can call directly um, and they will have a great conversation. And I'm pretty sure UNM has a diplomat in residence. So you can touch base with the diplomat in residence. Regarding the security clearance, which was another question that was asked, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is still the case, but no drug use. Um, so, you know, marijuana is illegal on the federal uh, level. So um, I, if you have smoked marijuana, you know, you can say, yes, I did it. And I think there's a certain number of years that had to have passed since that last usage. Um, you need to be totally honest. Um, but they're going to, you know, to get those higher levels, you know, to be an intern, it's a pretty low level of clearance. But as you go higher and higher in your career and do require higher levels of clearance, um, you know, did you have a relationship with a Cuban national? Have you, you know, have you had a relationship with a Chinese national who was part of the Chinese government? Though that you start getting into those types of um, questions, and and those are the kind of things that you'll have to actually, you know, explain. Do you have a business in interests in China? <laughs> you know, things like that. So, but I imagine most people um, on this probably none of that stuff applies to you because it's pretty rare, but those are the kind of things. I think the biggest issue is often drug use. I don't know if anyone yeah. else has anything to say about clearance. I can add to that a little bit. And I, I had a security clearance when I was at the Commerce Department. Um, and they will, they'll look into your background, you know, um, and it, it's a process that ensures that, uh, you know, you've got the background and, uh, and the trustworthiness to potentially uh, know classified information. Um, and, uh, you know, they'll reach out to family members and friends to, to ask about you. You're allowed to provide a certain amount of references. 
you know, and that's important as you're as you're building uh, your skill set and as you're networking, even as you're networking with your professors and your your fellow uh, students and your cohorts, um, you know, to, to build up those references uh, so that well, when if you when the opportunity comes, if you are up for a security clearance and they ask you who are your references, who can we talk to that can talk about your personal background and your professional background, you're able to put forward. Uh, upstanding folks that will not only give you a good recommendation, but also reflect positively uh, on the type of, of person um, that you are as well. And so it's all about uh, building since now um, uh, the, the foundation for you to be able to uh, not only get internship opportunities and job opportunities and other things, but when the time comes for you to have that dream job or, or you know, work in the FBI or work in the State Department or, and, and pass a security clearance, um, that you're able to do that as well. Yeah, and one thing that um, they do look at is debt. So if you have large amounts of debt um, and if you have uh, unpaid uh, bills and, you know, hundred, you know, I'm not sure what those numbers are exactly that determine if someone is vulnerable, but if you owe a lot of money, you could be a security risk because someone could buy you off. Um, but also just, you know, making sure that your credit is okay and making sure that those things, uh, those are factors that actually go into security clearances. Yeah, and I'll just, the one last thing that I'll add to the security clearances, they're, they're primarily looking at whether or not you would lie or that you would say uh, something that's incorrect. So whatever you do, when you get to that point, if you smoked or you, whatever you, you've done, just make sure that you tell the truth and let them know because that's what they're trying to get, get at. And they wanna make sure that somebody to Soledad's point earlier, won't have any leverage over you as a, a person working for the federal government or the White House or whatever. So just be honest. Because they will find out because they 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 literally went to like pe people's homes that I had said were good friends. And the other thing is, is and that's the worst part is you have to go back 10 years of every place that you lived. Um, and as a campaign worker, we all as all of us know, we I, we lived in like 15, 20 places in a year. So like it's hard to remember where you're at. So kind of keep those things in your back of your head um, and, you know, it'll make your life a little bit easier. They also, you have to document every foreign person that you know who you consider a friend at a certain level, they will go and talk to former partners, boyfriends, girlfriends, whatever. They talk to my parents' neighbors who had never met me before. I mean, so these, they take months and months, um, cost a lot of money and are very extensive. Um, so anyway. So that, just to clarify, this is not for the hill. This is for positions in the executive branch. So working for one of the agencies, particularly, maybe not as thorough for an internship. It's once you get these full-time positions and even depending on what type of position you get, you know, if you're getting into intelligence, uh, state issues, it's gonna be at a higher level. But when you're working for an elected member, a Senator or a Congress person, um, they do not have that security clearance. And in fact, the hiring process can move very, very quickly. Yeah, good clarification. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. So outside of the Hill or even on the Hill, what are the different jobs and what are the different skill sets that people can be working on building? I'll go first. Um, so there are different types of uh, uh, expertise that you can have to get a job on the Hill or to do an, an internship. Uh, and a lot of them sort of overla um, overlap with one another, but they're critical for um, you know, working at an agency or working on the Hill. So um, the first is working on policy. So a lot of people are uh, classified as legislative aides or LAs uh, and those people that work on policy all day and they, uh, they do a lot of research, they look at a lot of statistics, work with different committees uh, and they typically are geared towards uh, finding information that will back up a legislative proposal that will solve a problem for the American people. Um, a second position somebody could get or be interested in in an internship or a job is communications. Um, all of the members of Congress and even in federal agencies um, have to communicate their message. What are they working on? What are some of the successes that they've had? How do they solicit information uh, from citizens and, and, and different stakeholders? And that 
takes a communication staff that helps um, to do all the things that we see online, whether it's a digital social media, um, whether somebody's giving a, a speech, you know, some uh, staff had to write that speech and they had to find the information and put the words together that made it sound really good and all, all that kind of stuff, uh, you, you know, to managing the website and those things. So communications um, is another area. And then uh, there are the managerial positions, which are typically like your chief of staff or the staff director of the committee. I saw that in a, in a chat um, or a director of an agency or something like that. Um, and those are the individuals who are tasked with managing the mission of the organization uh, and, and hiring the staff and dealing with all the day-to-day, -day, but also dealing with um, uh, things that happen every day. If there's a natural disaster, how are you going to address that? If there, uh, if there is something in the news that happened where, uh, you know, that needs to be addressed. Um, those individuals are typically at the forefront of not only sort of the minute details and inner workings of the organization, but also dealing uh, with crises. Um, and so those are just a few of the positions um, that exist in a lot of these organizations and offices. And Maria, Raul, Raul, okay. Yeah, I was just gonna say there, you know, um, to expand on that, there, there, there's also, uh, you know, there's not just the Hill and the federal piece on there, but there's also committees like the DCCC, uh, the DSCC, uh, the DLCC. So the DCCC is a democratic uh, campaign committee, which gets uh, members of Congress elected to, 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 to Congress. DSC is the same thing, but for the Senate. DLCC is the Democratic Legislative uh, Council for, for down ballot for state assemblies and so on and so forth. Uh, so those are, there's also that cluster. Then there's also another cluster for those of you who wanna go on and become lawyers. Um, there's lots of advocacy lawyer, uh, uh, lawyers or lawyers offices like, you know, an Aiken Gump or Perkins Cooey or, you know, uh, Brownstein Farber uh, that advocate on different uh, you know issues too. So there's that that cluster as well. Um, then there's also the advocacy cluster. So if you believe in that 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 no one should tread on you and 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 and, and women's rights and what they should you know to, you know people telling them what they should do, uh, then you have some groups like Emily's List or. You have groups like the LCB we mentioned earlier, if you're into the environment, um, you know, so there's, there's, there's something for everyone. I will say this though, the difference is pay. <laughs> so if you're looking to go out and make a gazillion dollars, you're not going to do that at LCB. You're not going to do that at, you know, climate, you know, thing. Uh, you may do it at a, at a law firm for sure. Um, but then, I mean, the end result is for me, was I wanted to, you know, I, I said, you know, I want to do good, but I also want to make sure that, you know, my idea of success is, God forbid, my mother were to get sick, uh, and that I would have, and that we would have to take care of her. I would want to be able to take care of her and not feel the financial impact, and that's success to me. So, um, you know, so I've got to that point, and uh, you know, so and and I work for, you know, one of the, you know, we're, you know, um, public affairs firm in the country, uh, in the world, actually, um, that allows me to do that. And so, you know, you just got to figure out what that is. Uh, and then there's also spaces to, um, you know, there, there, there's something, you know, like Maria said this, I mean, DC is, at, it's, New Mexico is where my heart is and, and DC is where like my mind and my business is, you know? Um, but I love it there too. There's just something always going on. There's always something for you to do. There's always something for you to learn. Um, and it's just how much initiative you wanna take and how much you wanna take that on. And uh, so there's, so, you know, if, you, if you're not looking at the Hill or the, or the you know, federal aspect, there's, there's something for everyone, believe me. And if there's not something for everybody, you can go and start it up yourself. So that's the other beauty about DC. They're all, oh, I care about carrier pigeons and nobody cares about them. So let's start that up, you know? So it's, it's there, there's something for everybody. Maria. The skill set and all the positions that people talked about, I really think are the same. Uh, and you gain them honestly through experience by learning them. It's understanding how the system works. You know, how does a bill get 
get moved into law? How do people influence those changes? Who are the decision makers? How do you build coalitions to get your point across, to raise your message? So it's learning those, it's learning how the system works and it's learning solid communication skills, how you create a message, how you articulate your message, whether it's on behalf of you yourself, whether it's on behalf of your boss, whether it's on behalf of your client or your advocacy and your message. And those, you know, are transferable. But like I said, it, it's through experience that you grow that skill set. Great. Well, I think we're coming to the end of our time. Um, I will give each of the speakers um, one final uh, minute to give a little bit of words of advice or tell us, you know, the biggest surprise that they found in DC um, or, you know, one, uh, you know, tidbit of knowledge that you wish someone had told you when you were in college. So um, let's uh, start with Aaron and then we'll go to Maria and then Raul. Great. Um, the biggest thing I would say that I, I wish I had known and, uh, you know, a part about my personality is I always was sort of wanted to hustle and work really hard and demonstrate that I was, you know, taking on a little bit more. And, and that's what helped set me apart and differentiate me maybe from other people who had my same position or, you know, uh, my colleagues and stuff like that. Um, and and uh, the way that I can describe that now and and I'm, I'm smarter about it now, you know, work smarter, not harder. You should still work hard, but um, it's finding ways to create structure and value where none exists. And if you can do that, that's going to differentiate you from the rest of the pack. That's going to help you get that promotion. That's going to help you turn that internship into a job. Uh, and and the, the other thing I uh, tell folks that I mentor is don't be afraid to move around to move up. Um, t try different positions. If you're in a legislative position and you want to go work on a campaign, go work on a campaign and move around. Um, I've been able to move up in my career because I deliberately tried to do different jobs so that I could get the experience, to Maria's point, uh, so that I could eventually be a chief of staff. Um, and so uh, it's important to have that breadth and depth of experience in different positions uh, if, if moving up is, is something that you want to do. So those are the two things I can share. Create structure and value where none exists and move around to move up, especially now that, that you're young. That was really impactful, Aaron. And in fact, it made me reconsider everything I was going to say. So uh, this is maybe along with my, my biggest surprise in my career or my experience is my word of advice is be open to trying something different. I talked about doing a lot of career counseling in, in my time and that actually the people who worried me the most are those who came in with the five and the 10 year plan is like, and I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna do this and then I'm gonna do this and are very fixated on it. It's good to have a plan. It's excellent to have goals. But if you go in with blinders, it's like, I, this is all I'm doing. You don't see all the amazing, wonderful things that are out there. I never thought I was depressed in communications. I ended up being a spokesperson on a presidential campaign because someone came to me and said, hey, I can see you in this, you know, you should apply for this, try doing this, went through a training and it opened up all these possibilities for me. So have your goals, but you remember when I started off, I started talking about storyteller, you know, you're the author of your own story. So be willing to let your story go off on different paths, even those where you don't know the ending to yet. Yeah, no, that's that's 100. Like I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have the 10 point year, five year plan. I just kind of went there. All you're gonna do this, you're gonna do this, and that's how it happened for me. Um, because I believe one that everything happens for a reason. So that's my philosophy. I live by. But um, there's some advice that I got and that I share with everybody. Um, don't be an asshole to people because you never know who your boss is gonna be. Um, because, honestly, I, I, so I'll use the example. My, the, the political director of the Biden-Harris campaign, uh, Aaron, uh, was my 
regional, Northeast regional political director when I was the political director at the, DN at the DNC. Then she became the, the, the national political director. And then they asked me to do state director for the state of New Mexico. So technically she was my boss, right? <laughs> so had she hated me, she would have been out no, you know, or vice versa. So don't be, jerk, don't be nasty people because you just never know who your boss is gonna be. Or you might work for an intern, like, or, you, or you know, some, you know, Maisie's gonna be the next Congresswoman from New Mexico, you know, but she remembers how, you know, how you treated her. So don't treat people that poorly because they will remember and it'll come back to you 100%. The other thing was, is I was told by my mentor and a friend of Maria's as well, Moses, <laughs> uh, um, who's one of the top lobbyists uh, in, in, in DC. Um, he said, always act like you've been there before. Um, so don't, you know, you know, and I, and, and so, and, and it's true. So I remember the first time when I briefed the president in the Oval Office for the first time, I was like, literally like, you know, sweating and like everything else. And, and then the inside, I was just like, holy shit, this is crazy. Some small town ass kid from New Mexico is doing this right now. And, but then I was like, okay, I, I belong here. I've been here before. And it was like, you know, there you go. And then they remember they're okay. Again, remember, be the calm person, be the person in the room that people want to go to to ask for help and ask questions to. Then after you're done with all of it, I went across the street from the White House and screamed off my, my a lot of top of my lungs, like, what the heck just happened? Like, you know, so, so do that. You can do that, but do it on your time, but I always act like you've been there. And those are my advice. Thank you, Raul. Um, yeah, and I, I want to echo that. Be humble. Don't be a jerk because you never know who you're going to, you know, want to build a relationship with. Um, and also be totally open. You know, I had never really traveled outside of, actually, I had never traveled outside of the United States um, growing up. So I had no idea that um, international affairs was something that I would become so passionate about. Um, and there were, you know, some jobs that I had on the Hill, like I hated being a legislative correspondent. It's a horrible, it was a horrible job for me. Um, but there were plenty of other jobs that definitely took my best skills and put them to use. And I think part of it is also identifying what you really enjoy doing. And, you know, once you can narrow down what you love to do, there's going to be plenty of opportunities. Um, and that's going to be a really big step is figuring that out. Um, so anyway, um, I want to thank everybody um, for joining us. I hope that the information is helpful. Um, and I will pass it to Francis to close off. I just want to say this was just a fantastic uh, session. Thank you so much, Maria, Raul, and Aaron, uh, and Soledad, for sharing your uh, experience and advice in this, you know, such an open and generous way. Uh, we've, you know, the, we've all benefited from li from listening to you this evening. So thank you very much. Great. Thanks, and have a wonderful night. Can we do a, an everyone's a lobo before we before we close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You lead it, yeah, Aaron. Okay, here we go. Everyone's a lobo. Woof, 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 woof. woof. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that was a screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone. It was awesome. Bye -bye. Awesome being right. with you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.